So let's go to the first of our presenters. Uh, it's Anne Bride Proceda from Orsted. She's the GIS manager. And she'll talk to us about how a predominantly North Sea EMP company changed direction to become a fully fledged, profitable renewable energy company now with a global footprint. I'm sure we're all excited to hear about it. So, Anne, over to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, and uh, this is probably going to be a little bit of a less technical presentation than uh, the ones you've seen before. So um, I hope you can live with that. Um, so welcome to this presentation on uh, on Earthstill Offshore Wind um, and how GIS is used for developing, constructing and operating offshore wind farms. So my name is uh, Annabelle Posina and I'm the head of the GIS team which currently consists of 20 plus GIS specialists supporting all of our wind, farm, uh, wind farms globally. Um, from uh, from our, currently our three offices in, uh, in Denmark, in the UK and in Taiwan. So who is Rastel? Um, well, we are the global leader in offshore wind. Um, and for the second year in a row, we've been ranked the number one um, most sustainable company in the world by the Corporate Knights Global 100 Sustainability Index. Uh, and actually just, I think it was last week, uh, we made the Times 100 most influential companies in the world. So we're very proud of that. Um, our vision is to create a world that runs on entirely on green energy. And our target is a farewell to CO2 and a 98 a percent reduction in emission by 2025, which will uh, make us carbon neutral in energy generation and operation. So I joined Erstel Offshore Wind uh, in 2010, which is now a little bit uh, more than a decade ago. Um, and at that point of time, there was no independent offshore wind division. Um, we had built less than 850 megawatts uh, of offshore wind um, and our market at that time was Northern Europe, which was also where our offices were located. And the company consisted of uh, three main div uh, divisions, so oil and gas, power plants and energy distribution, where oil and gas were the biggest part of the company. So today we have completely said goodbye to oil and gas. We sold off all of our uh, oil and gas assets some years ago. Uh, and we are now a global company on a global market. We currently have about uh, 7.5 gigawatts in, in operation across the world um, and are building uh, currently uh, another 2.3 gigawatts uh, in two projects. So one in, in the UK and one in Taiwan. And the company today is built up by three major uh, areas. So we have offshore wind, we have onshore, and we have market and bioenergy. So that's really the main part of our businesses. So ASA differs a lot from many of our competitors as we both develop, construct, and, and operate offshore wind farms. Um, and my team, the, the offshore wind uh, GIS team, we support throughout the lifetime of a wind farm, which actually also means that we have this cradle to grave view on data and, and development and really try to focus on that throughout all phases. So we actually start out uh, before development in the really early uh, pre-development phases where we uh, help um, assess new markets uh, and project opportunities. We support with uh, feasibility studies uh, and due diligence and really help uh, support some good business decisions on uh, which projects to go for. And at some point of time, we moved towards the developed phase. This is really where uh, we either have a project uh, or are uh, looking to bid for a, a potential project. Um, and here, uh, and I'm sure that if some of my team members uh, are on the call, they will probably laugh a little bit because I say this quite often, but we really sit as, as this spider in the middle of the spider web um, because we really support the entire project, working with all uh, the different teams that are involved in developing a wind farm. 
So, um, for instance, we work with uh, our permitting team, supporting environmental impact assessments, uh, doing visualizations for public consultations or um, any kind of reporting for uh, governments or uh, something similar. We also work with our geophysical and our geotechnical teams, preparing for surveys, uh, QAing data, incorporating data with project data. Um, and, and then we also work with all of our technical teams. So pretty much all the components of the wind farm. So our foundations team, our cables team, um, our turbine teams and, and the onshore teams. Um, so really, uh, gathering a lot of data uh, across the, uh, the development phase. And we also do uh, wind farm layouts, cable routing planning and site scoping. And then uh, the final thing is to, uh, which is actually one of the first things that we do in the development phase is to define some standards, some geospatial standards for each project. And this is really to ensure uh, that the data that we collect in the very early phases can also be used throughout the lifetime of the projects. So as we move into construction and preparation for construction, our uh, standards uh, and our standard documents are incorporated into all of our installation contracts. And this is really to ensure that the data that we get throughout uh, construction is to the, to the quality uh, and the standard that, that we require. And in these, uh, in these standard documents, we also define um, how we want to receive data, um, when we want to receive data, um, and then the geodetic standards. And during construction, we really have this day-to-day -day collaboration with the entire construction team, the back office, uh, and all the installation contractors. And this is really to ensure that uh, we have or the project has a joint view of the world uh, so we can reduce any risks of accidents um, from people not knowing where everything is and then finally uh, we really need to ensure high accuracy of the as-built documentation that we take through to the operation phase so at some point of time we finish building uh, and we're ready to operate our wind farm and in this phase, which is uh, currently about 25 to 30 years, um, there is ongoing reporting to the authorities. Um, and of course, we use all the data that we've taken from construction uh, to uh, ensure asset integrity. So for instance, monitoring whether our ex uh, cables are uh, getting exposed or uh, we see uh, seabed development that we didn't expect uh, or things like that. Um, and again, we also support uh, all of our geophysical surveys um, and collect data if anything uh, needs updating uh, so we can continue to operate our wind farm. And then finally, we also enable uh, access uh, to all of our essential data uh, for all of our maintenance and repair work. So the main responsibilities of my team is really these four different categories. Um, so the first one is data management and visualization. So as you may have seen from the previous slide, we collect a lot of data and a lot of different data. Um, and, uh, and, and we, as I also said, we, we try to uh, set a data standard very early and then maintain this throughout uh, uh, a project lifetime, but also across all the projects. And then we do a lot of visualizations uh, and visualizations should really be thought of in a broad term. So obviously we do create a lot of maps for um, official um, documentation or for reports or similar, um, but we also maintain uh, online viewers for internal and external use, uh, both in, in 2D and 3D. Um, and then um, we do a lot of geospatial analysis. This is really classic GIS. So everything from proximity analysis, constraint analysis, volume calculations, raster analysis, and much, much more, really depending on what's going on in the project at, at any given time. 
And then, as I said, we set the standards, uh, and these standards really try to maintain across the projects. Uh, so it's the geospatial data, uh, for instance, the geodetic standards, uh, both the horizontal and the vertical standards. Um, and and this is really also to ensure that, that all the teams that we work with uh, know um, what the project looks like uh, when they need to start developing uh, and constructing the wind farm. And then final, finally, we also uh, maintain a number of tools and digital products. Uh, so for instance, we use, um, we use field apps to allow uh, the projects to collect data in the field. Um, that could be anything from um, looking at an onshore cable route or uh, mapping out different items uh, and, and really communicating uh, across different teams. So um, just an example of, uh, of what a new market could look like for us or has looked like for, for us. So um, we've been in the US since uh, 2015, uh, where we bought our first project along with uh, Res America. And uh, ever since that, We've expanded our scope uh, by buying up a number of companies. Uh, so we now have uh, expanded into both storage, solar, uh, offshore wind, and also onshore wind. We also currently hold uh, power purchase agreements for five of our offshore projects. Um, and we have one project in operation, which is the Block Island uh, project that we uh, bought uh, with one of the companies we bought uh, some years ago. So what have we learned from going into a new market? Well, we the, the lack of industry standards have really become very clear. Uh, it's very visible uh, when you work in a new market with new contractors, new partners, new governments, um, that the amount of industry standards are very low. Uh, offshore wind is still a very young industry and some industries would, uh, some sorry, some industry standards would really help to support the collaboration between contractors um, and governments. Then the, the other thing that we've learned is uh, working with consultants. We also work with consultants on other markets, for instance, the UK, um, but uh, consultants are very highly used in the US. Um, and a lot of them do not use GIS. Um, they primarily uh, work with CAT or Google Maps. And this makes it very, very difficult for us to uh, exchange data and also maintain a high level of precision on the data that we, we receive. And it also makes it very difficult for us to automate some of the processes where we were trying to exchange data uh, through services. Then uh, the next thing is access to data. We saw a really good presentation before uh, with, the, with the marine viewer. Uh, and one of the things that we've we do see uh, when we go into new markets that is that uh, getting any data can be really really difficult. But actually, in the U.S., it's been the the complete opposite. There's so much data available, uh, and a lot of uh, the different data sets overlap. Uh, so it's really really difficult to assess which one to use, which one is better than the other, um, and maybe you need a combination of different data sources. And then the final thing is units and geodesy. Uh, th this is probably a classic European company moving into uh, the US problem. Uh, but as I said uh, earlier, we really try to standardize across projects. Um, and it's really difficult uh, to develop projects in the US where uh, with a system that's built on a, on a metric system. Um, also, uh, when we work with uh, a lot of consultants. We've had to learn that the uh, sea charts uh, with depths are in feet and fathoms, which we are definitely not used to. So, uh, so we've had to uh, to move around that and and try to work with it. And then we still have some things to learn. Uh, we still uh, need to learn uh, more about governmental standards. Also because uh, the governments are learning and developing at the same time as we are. Uh, so it's kind of a moving target. Uh, 
And then we also still need to learn more about constructing a full-scale project in the US. Um, we have uh, helped uh, build a small-scale project called Virginia Coast, um, but uh, really moving into a full-scale scale project uh, is a new thing. So uh, maybe stepping a back, uh, stepping a, a little bit back, uh, and looking at uh, where did we come from with our oil and gas uh, uh, division. So I have to admit this is a bit of speculation from my side uh, because uh, when we had an oil and gas division, we were really two separate teams, um, but we did collaborate across. Um, there are some similarities and some things where you can transfer your knowledge from uh, oil and gas uh, and to, uh, uh, into offshore wind. Um, and the first one is really the power of GIS. Um, this is really where a lot of our uh, GIS skills is transferable. Um, mainly because in GIS, a dot is a dot. It doesn't really matter if the dot is an oil and gas rig or it's an, an offshore substation. That's additional information, uh, but the geographical information, whether it's one or the other, doesn't really matter. And the same goes with lines. Offshore cables and pipelines, they really work in the same way. Then also oil and gas and, uh, and offshore wind works with a lot of the same data types. Uh, for instance, our geophysical and our geotechnical data and and we, uh, for instance, work with a modified uh, SSDM uh, data model uh, when we uh, standardize our survey data. And then there's a the collaboration and integration. Uh, so many of the same types of teams are involved uh, and therefore also the same integrations with different uh, systems are also involved. 